Hey, everybody, and welcome to the Extraordinary Talk Show on another happy Monday. It's a happy Monday for me. I hope it's a happy Monday for you. Guys, it's been a tough year. Has it not been a tough year? I can tell you the last year has been very transformative for me. But 2020, man, that was a tough year. And even still, we're still struggling with a lot of the things that came from that. We could all write a book, if not series of books, on our own COVID story and what COVID was like for us and how it changed our lives. Because I guarantee you, none of you have the same life today that you had 15 months ago. Things have changed for you. Things have changed internally, inside, in what you believe. Things have changed perhaps even in your political beliefs, if not spiritual, if not having gained an, a greater understanding of yourself. Everyone, I think, on the planet who has heard of COVID could tell a COVID story. Right now, I want to talk about my COVID story and not my own personal, even though I had some pretty serious things going on, but specifically at work because my friends, I'm a registered nurse. I work nights in a nursing home. I love my job. When it was first offered to me, I immediately said no because I didn't think it was a job that I wanted, but there were enough signs pointing at it that I knew it was a job I needed to take. And those signs were not wrong. This job has been a miracle for me, has fed my soul and healed my soul in ways that I could not have predicted. And I started there about six months before COVID hit. Everything was great and groovy at that point. I was really feeling comfortable at work. And I had a darling little lady who would, I call it tootling, she'd push her wheelchair around with her two feet, not with her hands, and she would tootle down to the desk and ask to see what time the jazz game was supposed to start. And there was that one day last year when it began for me was when the jazz were supposed to play and Rudy Gobert, jazz player, had even been joking about having COVID and had licked the microphone as a joke earlier. But guess what? Rudy Gobert had COVID and that game was postponed at for minutes to minutes to hours. And then even though the, the entire stadium was full, it was canceled. The game was canceled. And my sweet little patient, um, for the sake of this, I'm going to call her Ida so I don't slip and say her other name because it, it is important to me to, to protect her privacy and her identity. She came up to me and she just, she was scared. The idea of not having her jazz games to watch was a scary, scary proposition for her. For her, it was a change in something that was so constant for her, something that she looked forward to so much. And my sweet little Ida really, really struggled as, as COVID came in. There's a lot of fear, so much fear, fear from the patients and fear from the staff. And I even remember another nurse, her daughter had called her. And so she had her daughter on speakerphone and her daughter was just in tears, in fear What's going to happen? What's going to go wrong? And this was before, really, we even had the full outbreak in America, and certainly not in Utah yet. At that time, things were still contained in Salt Lake. And at the time, I didn't understand that level of fear. Well, truth be told, I understand fear. I've had panic. I've had anxiety. I've been in that fear mode where I felt so much fear that logically there was a part of my brain knew was this fear was unnecessary. It didn't it even make sense. But yet the other 95% of my brain was clinging to that fear and I couldn't let go of it no matter what I did. So I do understand that kind of fear. By the time COVID hit, well, actually, I started on my antidepressants in February of 2020. Thank God. And I was one of the lucky, lucky few who found a good antidepressant right away. Because my goodness, if I had gone into COVID 
in the state of depression that I had been in prior to that, I don't know that I would have made it. If nothing else, it's possible that my whole soul could have been so sad that my immune system failed and I caught it and died. As it was, my soul was getting happier and happier through that COVID time. And one thing that blessed my soul that helped me was that I got to go help those people, these adorable, wonderful people who I love so much in my care center who were experiencing so much fear. And all that they have to know is what's on the news. And guys, what was on the news was scary. I've got these little old people, some of them as young as their 50s, some in their upper 90s, and everywhere through. And some of them are clear-headed and concise and can quote Shakespeare. And others in memory care who only know that something as scary is going wrong but don't really understand what. And my patients, everybody went on lockdown all at once. You understand how terrifying that was for you. Imagine what it was like for my 85-year-old patients who were told they couldn't come out of their bedroom. These are people who would go to the gym and work out on their own. These are people who would push their wheelchairs around and stop by all of their friends' rooms to say hello. These are people who looked forward to their meals so much that they would go to the dining room an hour to an hour and a half early because they knew their friends would too, so that they could sit with their friends and visit or sit with their friends in silence and wait for the meal to be served and then enjoy their meal together. Three meals a day for some of my patients was what they dreamed of. It was the best part of their day. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, they could no longer go to the dining room to eat. They couldn't leave their room unless they had a reason and were wearing personal protective equipment. A mask, at the very least, and in many cases, gowns and gloves, just to come out of their bedroom. But then guess what? As a staff, we had to wear all that same PPE or more than the patients did. Do you know do you know that there are patients in nursing homes who haven't seen their staff's faces in over a year? Guys, this kills me. And I will not admit to how much I have broken that rule. Because my people need to see my face. So my residents got sent to their rooms and told to stay there. Like a kid who who got in trouble. But they didn't do anything wrong. And her, they have telephones. They can call their families. But for so many of them, they had daily visits. For some of them, their family members would come pick them up and take them out, sometimes on a daily basis, sometimes a few times a week, sometimes once a month. But they got to go out. They got to spend that time with their family in a car, in a restaurant, in a store, even at their house holding hands and visiting and doing all the things that had always been so normal to them and all of a sudden they couldn't anymore. And they were stuck in their rooms and they were scared. And they're watching the news and believe me, the news did not give a hopeful story. The news taught them to be more scared. The news only gave them every little bit that could be expounded on and exaggerated to possibly make it scary. That's what my people were watching on the news. And that was all that they had. They would ask us for information when we came in. And what can we tell them? We're watching the same scary news stories that they are. And I'm praying that they're not hearing the stories about New York City, where the governor ordered nursing homes to accept COVID positive patients. They were ordered by the governor to bring people in that would infect everyone in the building because they didn't know how to protect against it yet. And not only everyone in the building, all the residents, all of the staff, and those staff would take it home and their families would get it and take it to their jobs. Millions more people tested positive for COVID because Someone who didn't have an understanding of care centers made a legal order 
that caused more hurt and pain than it ever, ever should have. And I'm praying that my patients don't see these stories. And then there's another home that was supposedly had so many people dying from COVID that they were hiding the bodies. I have no idea what was going on for there, going on there, but I hurt for them. If they were in such a position that they felt that was their only out, that that was what they had to do, can you imagine how terrified they must have been? And then I have my little people, who we all know are immune compromised, and all of a sudden, they no longer have contact with their families because their families can't come visit anymore. Their families can come visit outside of their windows. And thankfully, my facility is all one level. So the families could come right up to the windows of the patients, but they weren't allowed to open the window. Also, do you have an understanding that most of the people in this age range have poor hearing? The vast majority of my patients look at me when I speak, not only so they can hear my words, but because when they look at my mouth, it helps them put that together with what they're hearing because they can't hear everything but they put what they see from the lip reading together with the bits that they can hear and that's how we communicate so guess what happens when I walk into my patient's room and I'm wearing a mask and they can't see my mouth not only is their family muffled when their family stands outside the window they can't hug them they can't touch them and even their voices are muffled because they're coming through the window And when I speak to them, my voice is muffled because it's coming through a mask. And so here my patients are already lonely. Here they've been cut off from their friends, from their family, from the staff that used to visit them. Not only that, they're not having activities anymore. It used to be that there were one or two activities a day at least that they could leave their room and go to the activity room and join in an activity, a game, a a performance or something together. And we can't do that anymore. They're stuck in their rooms. And as a facility, we are required and still want to provide activities for our patients. But what do we do when they're all in their rooms? We can, here's one thing we did. We handed out bingo cards to everybody in their rooms and we would call out the bingo numbers over the loudspeaker. But do you think all my patients heard that? There are activities we can offer in their rooms, but it's, there's a limit to it. Now, my facility, we had an outbreak. In many ways, we were lucky because our outbreak happened early on, last June, right now, or a little bit before now. We're wrapping it up right about now. We had 18, 11 residents, 11 residents that tested positive for COVID. The building, the whole building went into panic. No one knew what to do. No one knew what to expect. The residents that were on the other halls that didn't have COVID were terrified. The staff was terrified. 18 of our staff members tested positive. And because they tested positive, that meant that they couldn't come to work for at least 14 days. Do you know what it's like to lose 18 staff members for two weeks? all in about a one-month time. It puts a cramp on the staff, and that puts a cramp on the patients. And it's a struggle. And everyone is just doing the best that they can. But that's one thing about it, too, was everybody did the best that they could. Everybody really, really did the best that they could. During our outbreak, One area where we lost almost all of our staff was in housekeeping. Our building, (laughs) we had no laundry. We were desperate to keep the place clean because we wanted to be aware of infectious disease, communication, all of those things. We didn't have housekeeping. We didn't have people folding laundry. We didn't have people cleaning. So you know what the staff did? We picked up the cleaners and the washcloths and we went down the hall and cleaned all the handrails and we wiped down the doors. And when we were in a patient's room and we saw that 
The floor was sticky. We knew housekeeping wasn't going to get to it. So we did it. And I'm a night nurse. I wish I could tell you the names of all of the people who went into that laundry room during the night and did laundry. CNAs, nurses, uh, even kitchen staff if they needed it. And we had one or two laundry people trying to come in when they could. And then our, we had other staff members who were coming in to do laundry, even though that was not their job. And we all just helped. And sometimes those of us at night that were in there folding laundry, for me it felt like the little elves in the story that helped the cobbler make shoes during the night. And sometimes I would have stacks of laundry that I had folded, and I would take so much joy in that and knowing that the person who was going to come in in the morning would see that all done and could feel like their day was going to be just a little bit better because some of what they needed to accomplish had been accomplished for them. And I don't tell you that to brag because I'm not the only person that did it. And even if I could name every person in my facility that did it, I couldn't name all the people everywhere that did those things. I can tell you, we do have another nurse named Sharon. And Sharon went to her church and begged her church for, for, for donations and received boxes and boxes, large boxes of amazing things that help these people so much. Little gifts when someone's hurting, when someone's lonely, when they're sad in their room. The littlest gift means something. So we brought in bottles of shampoo and conditioner and body wash and body scrub and loofahs and socks and undershirts and underwear. And these are things that, that should be basic, that should be standard, that in my mind, everyone should have a right to these things. And trust me, our people weren't going without those things anyway. But ours don't smell like melon cucumber. And the ones that were donated, a lot of them did smell like melon cucumber or other wonderful things. And it made our people feel special. And they needed it. When we went into their rooms, and so over time, over as the year progressed, we gained a little bit of understanding about how to address things and what things were really necessary and what things weren't. Truthfully, we didn't figure all that out. There is a whole lot of information out there now and for months about what works with COVID, how to prevent it, how to treat it. And people aren't talking to each other. They're not sharing their secrets. If we could share what we know, what we know works and what hasn't worked, if we could work together, we could be a heck of a lot farther in healing our planet from COVID. <clears throat> Another thing that happened in my building Early in July last year, we wrapped up our COVID outbreak and we wrapped it up sadly because of my 11 patients who had COVID, four of them passed away. All 18 of my staff members survived, but I had one nurse who had COVID and she took it home and her husband caught it and he did not survive. That nurse didn't give her own life, but her husband gave his so that she could keep going to work and caring for people who needed her. It was such a relief when everyone was finally clear and we were two weeks out of our quarantine. And then here in St. George, Utah, there was a huge flood a tremendous rainstorm, and the city streets weren't prepared. And my building that sits just off the freeway and just down the hill flooded. Feet of water rushed through my building. I had over 60 residents. I say I. It's not my, I don't own the building, but believe me, it's my building, just like it's my, the building. This building belongs to every single staff member and every single resident. It's our building. Water poured through our building. We had to evacuate 28 residents to other facilities. 
These people had been through so much. And then they were shipped out. We know it's hard here, but it just got even worse. So now you get to go have it be hard over there at a new place that you're uncomfortable with. And guys, for these people, some of them have lived in this building for years. To leave and go somewhere else was more traumatic for them than getting COVID would have been. The good thing that came from that was my facility, which is a a somewhat older building, has gotten a top to bottom remodel. And on the inside, it looks amazing. And on the outside is looking more and more amazing every day. We're almost there. It's been almost a year since that flood. We're almost back up to normal. Keeping staff during COVID, we had so many people that just quit. There were so many people who realized a year ago, and they're still realizing it now, that they've been going to work at these jobs, not just at my facility, but everywhere, particularly, especially service jobs. They've been going to work at these jobs that they hated because they thought they had to. And then when COVID happened, they realized they didn't have to. When they couldn't do it anymore, they realized there were other ways. And many of those people were feeling the pinch now. Many of those people refuse now to go back to those jobs that they always hated because they're seeing that there's something else. There's another option. There's a better way. And I hope that we can honor those people by helping them find jobs that will serve them and that will serve us and by helping them feel like they can and that we will treat them with care and compassion when they do go back to those jobs. Because that's the reason why a lot of those people don't. Guys, I want to tell you another miracle that happened in my building. And this one maybe I am bragging about, but it wasn't really me. Early on in COVID, when the people couldn't come out of their rooms and they were so lonely, I heard on the news that cats and dogs couldn't get COVID. And I've heard since then some different information that disagreed with that. However, I thought this would be a perfect opportunity to take my dog to work. A few weeks ago, I told you about the amazing Great Dane that walked in my front door a couple of years ago. First, a puppy sat him, and, and then when his owner, my friend, couldn't keep him, he became mine. And he, was, he is a miracle. His name is Clifford. He's 127 pounds. If One of the wonderful things about Clifford is that no one has to bend down to pet him. Even if they're in bed and their bed is up high, he can put his head right up on the side of their bed so that they can pet him. Clifford is a miracle worker. The first time, I just took him around in the afternoon and we spent an hour or two visiting with different people, as many as we could. But for Cliff, that wasn't enough. And there was one day that I had my scrubs on. I was getting ready to leave for work. And he almost seemed mad at me. And he wanted to go so badly you got to understand this dog is smarter than an average dog. And he, he didn't just want to go with me. He wanted to go to work. And I took him to work. And I said, maybe if you do well, maybe we'll come back again next week. Cliff has been to work with me two to three nights a week, 12-hour shifts ever since then. And Cliff is working miracles. The minute we arrive and go through the door, Cliff takes off down the hall to go say hi to his friends. He goes in and out of every room. He'll stay longer if you have a treat. But he goes and visits every patient. And even in the memory care unit, they have to ask every time, how old is he? How much does he weigh? What's his name again? How old is he? How much does he weigh? What's his name again? And I will answer those questions over and over and over. Because this dog in this building brings these people so much joy. And for me, coming from where I was before COVID happened, six months before COVID happened, where I was in a severely deep, deep depression, having miracles fall into my lap is how I'm still here. I hope that your year of COVID had a lot of miracles. And I hope that those miracles are a lot of the reason why you're still here. And I hope that you have been able to be a miracle to others 
because the main reason that I'm still here, one of the biggest reasons is because over the last year, I've been blessed to be a miracle to others. And that's why I'm still here. I love you guys. That's the Extraordinary Talk Show for this week. Remember, I'm not trying to tell you what to think, but I'm trying to get you to think for yourself. With love from Delta.